So sometimes I wonder if I'm any different from a nice atheist. Like, I look at my life, and I, I look at, like, the time I spend on my phone. I look at the time I spend on sports or on video games, um, social media, whatever it is, my free time. And I wonder if that time that I spend so much of myself on is different from someone who doesn't know God. And so, you know, we know in Scripture that it says that, uh, that we'll be evaluated for what we've spent our lives on, right? And so I wonder, there's times where I wonder, man, am I spending my life on things that honor God? Am I different? Or am I just like someone who doesn't know Jesus? So maybe you've thought about this before, too. So you, you might have times where you uh, rub shoulders with people who aren't believers. And, and you might think, like, man, do I idolize the same celebrities that they idolize? Do I, you know, uh, spend all my time thinking about this or that video game just like they do? Do I uh, spend all my time, you know, constantly think about, doodle about, when my mind wanders, it goes to this, to on, you know, this, this next selfie that I want to take or this next TikTok video just like they do? Because... You know, like, here, here's another way to say it. My pastor growing up, he used to say, uh, God's plan to save the world is for people to see Jesus in us. And there's no backup plan. That's the plan. Jesus came, and he taught his disciples how to, how to display the gospel, and he died, and he resurrected, and he went back to heaven, and, and your job, he said, is to show other people what I'm like. That's the plan. But I think we struggle with that sometimes. If you're like me, I think there's sometimes where we struggle with that and we think, man, do I spend my life, do I spend my time, do I spend my, uh, do I think, do I act just like someone who doesn't know Jesus? Am I different as a result of knowing him? And so uh, that's a question that I struggle with. I don't know if it's a question that you struggle with, but I think that's part of what Paul is getting at in the passage that we're going to look at today. So we're going to look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. In a second, I'm going to read verse 1, but before I go there, I want to give you just two quick background tidbits, all right? So background tidbit number one, Paul was writing to the Roman church, and he didn't plant that church. So usually when Paul was writing a letter, he started the church in Galatia. He started the church in Corinth. He did not start this church, and so they didn't know him. And so he was writing to kind of introduce himself, introduce his message, introduce the gospel that he preached, all right? That'll be important later. That's number one. Number two, he was writing to that church. They had a lot of issues going on. They had a lot of tension happening, and it was ethnic tension. It was racially based tension. And the reason for that is because there was an emperor, uh, Emperor Claudius, and he uh, expelled all the Jews from Rome. So the Jews before that point, the Jewish Christians, they had been leaders in the church, they had been influential, and then all of a sudden Claudius said, You all have to leave. And so all of a sudden, in this church, all their leaders, all the influencers, it'd be like if you just like kicked out Pastor Rick, Pastor Jared, and Pastor Austin and said, figure it out, okay? So all the leaders were gone. And the Gentile Christians, Gentile just means non-Jew, everyone who is not a Jew, they had to step up and they had to lead, right? So that continues for a couple of years, and then Claudius dies, new emperor, doesn't renew that edict, and so the Jews come back. And those Jewish Christians who had been leaders, who had been influential, right? Pastor Rick, Pastor Jared, Pastor Austin, they come back and they expect to be in charge again. They expect to be leaders. They expect to, you know, be influencers in that, in that church culture. And the Gentiles were like, mm, no thanks. We've been doing this by ourselves for years now. We don't need all your uncomfortable Jewish things, like, like circumcision. Super uncomfortable. We don't need that, Right? So they were saying, no thanks, and the Gentiles were saying, so th there was conflict, right? And so Paul writes to a church that's having a lot of conflict, and I imagine what it would be like is if, if Paul was kind of like the parent, and there's these two sides, and they're coming to Paul, and they're like, Paul, tell them I'm right. And Paul doesn't tell them that they're right. Instead, he tells them, you are distracted, you are putting the wrong thing in the center of your life. You are acting just like everyone else. You're no different. 
You're just trying to get power for yourself. You're trying to make sure you're in charge. You're trying to make sure you're comfortable. That's just like everyone else. You aren't acting like a follower of Jesus. All right? So let's look now. Those are that, that's your background tidbit number two. Let's look now at Romans 12, verse 1. So it's on the back of your card if you want to follow. Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So Paul uses an important word in the beginning of this verse, and that word is therefore. So if you go to seminary like me, they tell you if you see a therefore, you have to answer, what is it there for? Because if there's a therefore, it means everything I'm about to say is based on something I already said. And so you need to know, what did he already say? So what he already said is what we were talking about before. Romans 1 through 11, he's talking about this is the gospel message, right? This is the message that you deserved death, but you got life. You deserved death, but you got forgiveness. You deserved death, but you got God's mercy, you got a relationship with God. So he lays that out in Romans 1 through 11, and that's what he's talking about when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God. He's saying, based on who you are, your gospel people, your people who have been shown mercy, based on that, this is what I want you to do. All right? So before I get to this is what I want you to do, I want to share a quick illustration on mercy. Because I think it's really key to understanding this passage that you understand what it is to be a sinner who's been shown mercy. All right, so there was a commander. He was leading an army in a time of war, and the food was scarce. And so they had to ration the food. Everyone could only have their ration. And so one day the commander is planning a battle. He's in his tent and the lieutenant comes in and the lieutenant says, sir, you're not going to like this, but someone's been stealing food. And the commander says, no, 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 we can't have that. We don't have enough food. So you find out who it is and you whip them 49 times. You announce that to everyone. That's what's going to happen. And you find out who did it. So the lieutenant says, okay. And he goes out and he does his investigation. He comes back a couple of days later. He says, sir, you're not going to like this, but we found out who was stealing food. The commander says, okay, great. Just like I said, whip him. The lieutenant says, sir, you don't understand. It was your grandmother. And so now the commander has a problem. Because on one hand, his grandmother is elderly. If he whips her, she'll die. On the other hand, if he doesn't follow up on his commands, on his authority... He'll lose control. He'll lose the respect of his soldiers. So the commander says, all right, gather the army. Tomorrow we'll administer the punishment. So the next day comes, and the whole army is gathered together, and the commander gets up in front of all of them. He reads out the crime that his grandmother committed. He reads out this is the punishment that she is to get. And then he takes off his own shirt, and he takes the punishment himself. That's mercy. And it's super important that we understand our part in that story. We're not the commander. We're not the lieutenant. Romans 1 through 12 says, you are the grandmother. You are the one who was caught red-handed in your sin, who deserved death, and who was shown mercy. That's who we are as gospel people. And so Paul starts with that because he starts with their identity. He wants to remind them, this is who you are. Act out of who you are. Act like gospel people. Don't act like everyone else. You're supposed to be different. You're supposed to be different. So the main message of this passage is this. God calls Christians to respond to his mercy by giving their whole lives to him in worship. God calls Christians to respond to his mercy by giving their whole lives to him in worship. So let's go back then to verse 1 and see what else we can find. We've established that he's saying that you're, you ought to put Jesus in the center, right? You ought to respond to God's mercy 
God's mercy determines who you are. You are gospel people. So verse 1, one more time. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And that's a little weird for us, right? We don't do sacrifices. You don't have like a goat or a lamb at home that you're planning to kill so you can be forgiven. If you do, that's weird. But for them, that was normal. That's just what you did. It'd be like coming to church on Sunday. You bring your animal on Sunday, and that's what you do. And if you were not a Jew, you would kill that animal, and it was like a way to pacify the gods, get them to leave you alone, right? If you were a Jew, you would kill that animal, and the reason why you would do that is so that you could be forgiven. Now, here's some, here's some extra tidbits about that system. So if you were a, a Jew in the Old Testament times, you would raise that animal from birth. It was almost like a pet. Not quite, but almost. There was an emotional attachment to that animal. So it hurt when you had to kill that animal because of your sin. Number two, there was also a financial attachment to that animal. Those animals were how you amassed wealth. And so it, was a, it hurt financially for you to have to give up that animal right? Paul knows this. His audience knows this. He's using the sacrificial system as a metaphor, and he's saying, hey, just like then, when you had to give up an animal and it hurt emotionally and it hurt financially, just like then, now I'm calling you to live in a sacrificial way. I'm calling you to sacrifice the things that are getting in the way of you worshiping God. I'm calling you to sacrifice whatever it is that you're putting in the middle of your life that's not Jesus. Because that's what's happening, right? The Roman church is sacrificing their witness, and instead, they're totally focused on who gets to be in charge, who gets to be comfortable. He's saying, no, 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 you need to sacrifice those things. You need to let go of those things that are getting in the way. So when he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, it's important to point out, he's not saying, like, harm yourself, right? He's saying, it's a metaphor, what he's saying is, that's why he says living sacrifice, what he's saying is, I want you to give your whole life, all of you, all that you do with your body, all of your behavior. So God calls Christians to respond to his mercy by giving their whole lives to him in worship. Now, Paul says this because he knows that humans, what we tend to do is we tend to take Jesus out of that place in the middle of our lives, and we tend to put other stuff there. We tend to let our lives revolve around other things. So, So for someone, it might be video games, right? All they do is think about Fortnite. They're either playing Fortnite or they're thinking about Fortnite. They're staying up all night playing Fortnite right? It's all they talk to their friends about. It's all they doodle on their papers. It's all they think about is Fortnite. That's worship. If that's the thing that you're most excited about, that you spend the most time on, that your mind is constantly on, that your passion is toward, that's worship. That's putting that thing in the center of your life. Right? So someone else, it might not be video, it might not be video games. It might be social media, Right? You might spend all your time thinking about this next selfie, all your time thinking about this next TikTok video, whatever it is. That's what you talk to your friends about. That's what you spend your free time on. That's what you think about the last thing before you go to bed at night. That's what you think about when you get up in the morning. That's what you're passionate about. That's worship. When your life revolves around something, that's worship. Now, here's the thing. Maybe... If you have that struggle that I have, and I'm not just like preaching about it and saying I have that struggle, I really have that struggle. If you have that struggle that I have where you think sometimes, man, am I actually different from people who don't know Jesus? Do I actually spend my life, my time on different things than people who don't know Jesus? If you wonder that, if you wonder why why, why am I not different? Well, maybe it's because we worship the same things that the world worships. If you wonder, if we wonder why we aren't different, maybe it's because we call ourselves Christians, 
but we worship what the world worships. So it's naive of us to think that if I spend all my time, all my passion, all of my everything on this thing over here, and then I come to church for an hour on Sunday, that I'm living a worshipful life. That's what Paul's getting at here. He's saying you've put something else in the center and you need to get that out of the center. You need to sacrifice those things. You need to put Jesus in the center. That's how we become different. So God calls Christians to respond to his mercy by giving their whole lives in worship to him. So we've established, right, that, that, that what Paul's saying is he wants them to respond to God's mercy. He wants them to keep in mind they're gospel people. He wants them to uh, present their bodies as a living sacrifice, right? Make their whole lives about Jesus. All right, so now let's move on to verse 2. So Romans 12, verse 2, another way that we can worship. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So there's two big verbs in the beginning of that passage. He says, do not conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so basically, the first verse is about your behavior. It's about what you do with your body. The second verse is about your thinking. So part of your worship is not just in what you do, it's in how you think. He's saying, don't be conformed to their way of thinking. I like the way that the J.B. Phillips paraphrase puts it. It says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Because be sure that is what the world will try to do. To get you to think like they think. All of the media we consume, all of the things we read, the things we watch, the things we listen to, it's trying to convince you of a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of believing that is apart from Christ. You need this to be happy. You need to go here to be happy. You need to look inside yourself and follow your dreams to be happy. And so he's saying, do not conform to their way of thinking. Right? Earlier, uh, in another passage, Paul is talking and he says, man, when, when Greek people look at the gospel, they think we are idiots. When Jewish people look at the gospel, they say that makes no sense. When, when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus is on trial before Caiaphas. He's on trial before Pilate and they're mocking him. They're disgusted with him because he will not conform his thinking to the way they want him to think. That's part of what it is to be a believer, to resist conforming to their way of thinking. And then the second thing he says is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what does renewing your mind mean? Renewing your mind means filling your mind with the things of God. It means filling your mind with things that will help you follow God. Filling your mind with things that will renew your commitment to Jesus being in the center, whether that's podcasts or books or movies or the people you spend time with, whatever it is, he's calling on them, renew your mind, renew your commitment to Jesus. You're constantly bombarded by someone else, other forces wanting you to conform to their way of thinking. You need to constantly strengthen the way of thinking you want to be more part of your life. Renew that commitment to Jesus. So I've been trying to do this. I've been listening recently to a podcast. The podcast is called Dad Tired. Um, and the whole purpose of the podcast is uh, about helping men follow Jesus and also helping them to, to lead their families to follow Jesus. All right? And so the reason why I started listening to this is because I was writing this sermon and I felt convicted that I spend way too much of my time entertaining myself when I could be spending that time renewing my mind. I could be spending that time strengthening my commitment to following Jesus, but I'm spending it entertaining myself. There was an interesting phrase that a certain author used a few years ago. He said, we are in danger of entertaining ourselves to death. And so 
That's, that's what I felt convicted about. And so I started listening to this podcast, and uh, it's had a huge impact on my life. Huge. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. It's had a huge impact on my life. It's made me want to uh, serve more at home instead of just being a consumer. It's made me want to put my phone away and pay attention to my family. It's made me want to pray over my family, pray with my family. I could tell you thing after thing after thing after thing that has come from me listening to this podcast, me choosing to renew my mind. So rather than just listening to like sports talk radio, which is what I would listen to before, this thing has been helping me, this podcast has been helping me renew my commitment to Jesus, give me ideas on how I can express that commitment to Jesus. Now, I don't tell that story so that you think I'm super awesome. I'm not. I tell you that story because I want you to know I genuinely am trying to live out and I'm genuinely struggling with the topic of the sermon. And so I would encourage you to consider what is the thing that you could sub out to have more Jesus in your life? What is a way that you could choose, hey, I want to renew my mind. I want to make sure that I'm not just like everyone else. I want to respond to God's mercy by giving my whole life in worship to him. And I know, I know that there's constantly things in my life that are trying to pull me away from that. There's constantly things in my life that are trying to distract me, just like the Romans were distracted. And so I'm going to choose to renew my mind. What would that look like for you? So we've established, right, that Paul's saying, based on God's mercy, based on the gospel, put Jesus in the center. Don't conform, renew your mind. All right, let's look back at verse 2 one more time. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what he says here is when you do all those things, you're going to be able to know the will of God. When you do all those things, you're going to be able to carry out God's will more often. You're going to be able to be different. Now, you won't be perfect because we're all sinners. But he says when you're doing these things, when you're putting Jesus in the center, you're resisting the thinking of the world, you're renewing your mind. You're going to be able to to evaluate what's next in your life by asking the question, is this a decision that will help me honor God? Is this a decision that will help my family or my friends to see Jesus in me? Right? So he says, if you do this, you're going to be able to discern God's will. You're going to be able to act in God's will. You're going to be able to be focused again on what you're supposed to be focused on. So I have a mentor in my life. He's been my mentor since uh, high school. His name is Craig. Um, And when I was in high school, I was like an anxious little kid. And I had like questions for Craig every week about like what I should do. Right? I had, I had have a list, and I would pull out my list from my pocket, and I have 10 questions for Craig, and I was worried that I was going to do everything wrong, okay? So that, that was high school Peter, all right? So I had this mentor, and, and, and I would come to him with these questions, and he's still in my life. He's still kind of like a father figure to me, but now I only really go to Craig about like, you know, maybe once a year, maybe less than that. And the reason for that is because I've spent so much time with Craig that I don't need to talk to Craig anymore. I know what Craig would say. So a situation comes up, and it's like I have a little Craig on my shoulder. And like I can just look at that situation and say, yep, that's what you would say, isn't it? And I don't need to go talk to Craig. Because that's what happens. When you spend enough time with someone, you get to know them so well, you understand how they think, you become like them, it's the same way with Jesus. When you spend that time renewing your mind, putting him in the center of your life, rejecting what would threaten having him in the center of your life, it's going to be like you have a little Jesus on your shoulder. And you're going to be able to do what verse 2 says, which is to discern the will of God. You're going to be able to see this is, uh, this is what a gospel person would do. And you're going to have more strength to be able to do that. 
So what is this? How does this apply to you? I think a lot of us struggle with worshiping idols. I think we tend to put other things in the center of our life to be most excited about, to be spending our time on, to be thinking about other things. But God calls us to respond to his mercy by giving up our whole lives from worship to him. And so what you have to do first, if you want to do that, is remove the idol. Remove the thing that's not supposed to be in the center of your life. And so you might have to ask yourself, what's the thing that I'm most excited about? If somebody asked my family, my friends, what's he all about, what would they say? What's the thing that you think about first when you get up in the morning, last when you go to bed at night? What's the thing that gets you most excited? What's the thing that gets you most depressed? Right? So the answer to that question might be something that you struggle with making an idol. Right? So that's step one, is figuring out what is that idol? What is it for me that could get in the way of me living a worshipful life? Because the Romans weren't paying attention to that. And so they got distracted. Okay? Dream with me for a second. What would happen? What would happen if we really lived like Paul is talking about here? What would happen if Christians were constantly focused on how God has shown us mercy? Might we be more merciful? Might we be more gracious? Might we be known for our love as Christians instead of our judgment? What would happen if we were, uh, you know, constantly putting Jesus in the center of our lives, constantly renewing our mind to focus on Jesus? Might we see a church that looks like Jesus? Might we see uh, people coming to know Jesus in just huge amounts, right? In, in Acts 2, it says that so many people came to know Jesus. Thousands and thousands were coming to know Jesus every day because they looked at the Christians and they were different. The way they treated each other, the way they saw life, it was different, and they wanted to be part of it. At that time, they were doing a great job acting on what we talked about. God's plan to save the world is for people to see Jesus in us. Well, thousands of people were coming to see Jesus because the church looked like Jesus. It seems to me that if we were to respond to God's mercy by giving our whole lives to him in worship, we would be different, and the world would be different too. So I want to give you guys a chance to respond to this message. We're going to take some time to discuss like you usually do. We're going to put a couple of questions up here, and you can discuss in your groups. Thanks for giving me your attention tonight.